for those of you tuning in and those of you watching the record version, let me just kind of set this up real quick. Man, I have the absolute pleasure sitting with my friend and classmate from West Point, uh, class of 99, um, Babe Kwasniak. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, kind of kept up with, with Babe over the years, even though kind of like most grads, the Army took us in different directions. And we never really, uh, you know, linked up out in the big Army or in, in life, um, living in different parts of the country and stuff like that. But one of the things that always impressed me is he embraced the um, – service a lifetime of service to the nation and he did it in different uniforms meaning you know he did it in the military as an infantry officer after west point um and then he got out and, and he got into uh sales and and medical in the medical field and continued to lead teams and and people there um in the corporate sector and became an all-star in that area then he got into coaching and won three state championships as a basketball coach over 10 years um, amazing accomplishments, you know, and those are great uh, in, in, in and of themselves. But when you talk to Babe, the thing I love about him is he cares for people so much. It almost comes out um, in, in tears almost every time we talk, man. I just, the passion, gosh. So, hey, I wanted to, I wanted to bring him on. And, and Babe, if I didn't do you justice, um, you know, with, the, uh, with some of the, the accomplishments you have, feel free to add in. Um, I'll, Are you I'll kidding me, brother? I feel like you should speak at my funeral. That was that could be my new. <laughs> I really, that's the great part about doing these, Chris, is is when you get those introductions, it's like being at your own funeral, and I, I really appreciate it. And yeah. the feelings mutual, brother. I'm, I'm so proud of what you've done. Um, I know we haven't had a chance to touch base much, uh, like we're going to now more in the future. But when we do, uh, it seems like we always we always you know talk about what we're passionate about is is, is leadership. And yeah. um, we both come from that from that at same institution. I think it's been it's been working since 1802, right? That's right. And uh, it's just an absolute. It's an honor to be here. It's it's an honor every time I pick up the phone, I get a chance to talk to you. But this is I know we've been talking about doing this for a long time, so yeah. can't wait. We never have a short conversation either, right? No, no, we don't. No, yeah, we don't. it's, it's at leave. least 30 minutes in, invested. And I I look in and I see, oh man, I get to talk to Quaz, man. So it's always a it's always a pleasure, man. Um, so, hey, there's many ways we could go uh, on this call. In fact, initially, a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about it, we thought we were going to go in one direction. Uh, and I think we've uh, we've done a frago, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In the military, a fragmentary order, basically changed directions. We call it an audible. Um, but uh, I'd like to revisit some of the points in your leadership journey, maybe in another um, talk. But, um, you know, you had a great suggestion this morning. So, basically... We're going to go at the racial um, tension, the racism that's affecting us right now. And I think we're just going to talk candidly about it. Um, you're going to hear from a world-class leader in, in Babe. And um, so let's just go at it, man. What, what's on your heart, bro? Well, what's done for me was uh, last night, Yeggs, I was uh, scrolling through social media. My, my wife tells me that I, I spend way too much time doing that. You know, not being connected to my family and being connected to, to what's going on. And, and obviously right now it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard to watch. There's a lot of people in a lot of pain, uh, a lot of suffering. And I saw a tweet from a young man that I coached. Uh, and obviously we'll go with no names here, but yeah. um, just one of the, I mean, when I say it's a son to myself and Laura, literally like a son to us, just somebody we, we think very highly of. And, you know, he had something, um, young, young African-American, and he had something to the extent of on Twitter just talking about, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not my grandfather. You know, it's time to start shooting. And, uh, you know, I just um, picked up the phone, called him. Um, I, I think, like you and I talked about last week, in the midst of this COVID, uh, sincere leadership has kind of gone out the window. Now, now from a chance just to lead by email or just, uh, you know, lead by not personally connected to somebody is, you know, is rampant. And so I, I picked up the phone and, and I talked to this young man and um, he's angry uh, and rightfully so. And I, I think a, a lot of part was I just kind of, I talked to him for about two hours and, and I know a big piece of this was, was he needed to get a lot of things off his chest. And I just felt um, for his future, uh, and I told him, I, I said, you, you, what do you think I'm calling you for? You think I'm calling you because we're going to end this whole thing? Do you think I'm calling you because I'm worried about what it looks like? And, you know, he used, he used a couple potty words. I, always respectful, always put coach on the end of it. And 
um, you know, started, you know, there were, there were some tears and, um, and basically just said, you know, no coach, I, I know that, that, that nobody cares about me more than, more than you do. And that nobody, you know, wants what's best for me more than you do. Yeah. And I, I said, listen, man, I, I will never, ever tell you to stop doing what's right. And I'm not saying this is what you're saying is wrong. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm saying is you're better than that. And just think before, before you act on emotion. And I, I told him like, from my own mistakes, right. Normally when you make a mistake and, um, and not in anything, but definitely in leadership is because you're just acting off emotion. And if you really want to make change, son, you, you have to, you have to think and you yeah. have to get to a position before you can constitute that change. And, um, I think somewhere along the line, Chris, we've, you know, I'm not doing this conversation any justice because we were, we were yelling at each other um, and uh, we were swearing at each other. And I think somewhere along the lines, we, we've turned that into that's always a bad thing, right? I think when the best way to develop tr trust is through the truth. And I think where this young man was coming from is he, he knew I was always going to tell him the truth, yeah. right? And, um, you know, and, and, and that was the part he was saying, well, coach, of course, I'm not talking about shooting cops. Well, people don't know that. Perception is reality. Mm. What about eight years from now? Someone reads this and they they think you are talking about, you know, and that and that's the picture they want to paint of you. Now you're letting them control the narrative, and you're not controlling what they want them to say about you. So, you know, um, my wife walked past last night when I was on the phone. I think she knew I was talking to. You. She knew you know how important it was, and I just think so many times, um, you know, these young people just want a voice to be heard. They just want someone you know just to listen to them. Yeah. And in my own experience from this i just start you know recollecting and thinking about the things i've gone through and i'll give you one example um a couple of years ago because in 2018 i was uh, like you mentioned we had a very successful basketball program i'm i'm super proud of, of what we've accomplished and, and the young men that we've you know had from our program and um we're probably probably been about 75 percent to 80 percent minority through the years so i think i you know i have, have a lot of experience with with young with young black men Absolutely. Um, you know, we, uh, every one of our guys has graduated from college once I've gone on from VASJ, um, uh, except we've had seven that have joined the armed forces, which obviously I'm super proud of awesome. being in my new role as a civilian aide. And, um, oh, I forgot to mention that. Hey, oh, yeah. tell me about your, your current, I'm sorry. It's uh, no, your, it's okay. your current role, civilian aide to the secretary of the army. Yep. C civilian aide to the secretary of the army. Um, uh, the the only thing that West Pointers that our classmates need, need to know about that is it's three star protocol. So that's all they need to know. Yeah. <laughs> nice. No, I mean our job is to tell a story uh, for the Army. So we're the conduit between the civilian sector and the Army. Yeah. Biggest honor of my of my life, my professional life. Appointed, I, um, appointed too. Not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah I was appointed yeah. on August twelfth. Yeah. Um, I really honestly thought I had no no chance. Just kind of went through the went through the protocols, and and here I am with a chance to to be on the greatest team in the world, is the United States Army. So, yeah, uh, awesome. God definitely has a plan. Um, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into that more. Uh, but in that in that role, you know, it's um, it's just been it's just been it's just been great. It's just been an incredible experience. Yeah. But going back going back to the story. So in 2018, uh, I, I was coaching, and we were playing our rival school. And our rival school is predominantly white, and um, and we were. we're Predominantly, predominantly minority, like like I told you, packed house, great high school basketball atmosphere, about as good as it gets. Um, and um, there was a a young person on their on and on their at, at their school that had a Snapchat video going around where he called one of our kids the coolest. Here's the coolest monkeys in the jungle, and they posted it. Um, now, you know, Chris, here, here's what I'll say. I haven't been working in high school for the last 10 years. Kids do stupid stuff, right? Like this, this young man did not, in my opinion, did not deserve to be expelled from it. Didn't deserve to be, you know, burned at the stake for it. I mean, he made, he made an honest, I mean, he made a mistake. Yeah. Um, yeah. it was, it, it made huge news. It was all over. It was, it got to ESPN. It was, wow. it took off. Yeah. It took off. I remember vividly because, because, um, at that point, um, I want to be careful how I, how I phrase everything. At that point, they issued an apology to our school. So yeah. they're, they're, the head of their school, their president, issued an apology to our school. Two Catholic schools, okay, two Catholic private schools. Yep. Uh, I, I think this is the important part to talk about because I, I really believe this is the crux of what's going on in our country right now. 
Um, at that point, um, our president got um, you know in front of the TV cameras and said, you know, we're 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 Christians, we're Catholics, just like they are. Big part is forgiveness. We forgive them. I remember thinking at that point, um, that's not your apology to accept. Uh, here I am, you know, grew up as a son of a high school basketball coach. You know, my, my, my first tape was run DMC for a guy named Curtis Jeffries, who was a lifetime Air Force guy. Uh, was, so was around, you know, black, black guys pretty much my whole life. Played, you know, played, played high school and college basketball at, at the Division One level. So, I mean, I played a predominantly black sport, uh, served in the U United States Army with minorities. And then here I am coaching uh, young black kids for the last 10 years. I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of, uh, you know, of kind of what they're going through and, and, and how they see, how they do things. At that point, I was floored because I thought the step that we seem to skip all the time is, is listening, Chris, yeah. is looking them in the eye and saying, hey, guys, how does this make you feel? And we skip that step from, from a leadership standpoint. Yeah. And um, um, now I can only look back on myself it's uh, I don't have many regrets, but it's one of the biggest regrets I have in 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 my coaching career. It's my, one of the biggest regrets I have in my leadership career mm. because uh, there were things that I wanted to do, you know, and and obviously people just wanted it to go away. They just wanted it. Administrations on both sides wanted it to go away. They they wanted to not get press. They wanted to not get publicity. And we had just won our second state championship. No, we just won our third state championship. So I was pretty high, you know, in terms of our profession in high school basketball. Yeah. And I could have made a pretty profound statement. And one of the things I was going to do, I remember at the time, is my associate head coach and one of my best friends, Raleigh Smith, was, was, a, was a black guy. I was going to say, well, why don't you coach the next game just for me to make a statement um, that, okay, this is, this is, that this isn't right. And we're not just, we're not just going to like let this go. Yeah, and I didn't because I had people talk me out of it, talk me out of it that wasn't you know the right thing. to include some of my coaches you know who, who were black. They said, "No, nah, coach, we don't think that's right." Um, and I look back and and um, you know I, I feel like that's probably the essence of leadership that I've always clung on to is soldiers mm -hmm. don't care how much you know, but they know how much you care. Right. And I can see the hurt in their eyes, Chris, when when someone accepted an apology and never asked them, you know, how do you feel. Uh, like a day later, one of our kids, um, he, you know, made a retaliatory snap chat. I'm not down with Snapchat, but he made a retaliatory snap and, yeah. and he got in trouble and he got suspended for it. The irony of that whole entire situation is, is that young man, his dad was one of my best friends, one of my, one of my, my best friends in high school still is. Yeah. I can vividly remember him being at my house for Halloween when his, when his boy was little and they, they would go, we would go trick or treating. And I can remember getting in arguments where he would say, you know, Quaz, your your three boys, they don't grow up in the same world my three boys do. And I and I would sometimes I would even say, Jason, don't don't pull the race card. Don't do that. You know, don't go there. And now I and I remember just being just feeling so much hurt because I'm like, man, I um like here I am, I've been right there and I never put myself in their shoes. Yeah. And that's something I, you know, I can't understand. Right. Um, and, we, and we never and we never will. Um, I read this uh, interesting post. I can't remember what platform it was on by Simon Sinek, um, one of the thought leaders of today, leadership thought leaders, author. And he said, hey, I have no idea what to do. He's a white guy like uh, so I have no idea what to do. Um, it's very frustrating. And then he gave some advice. And, I, and this was pretty compelling. I thought he said, I'm just going to call all my friends that are black. And I'm just going to listen. Just mm. like you said, man, listening. Mm. I'm just going to listen and hear them so they have a place to be heard. And if there's action that ensues that I can do to, to affect change, I will. But I just, the first call is I'm just going to call them and, mm. and listen. Um, man, it's so frustrating. Like, you know, trying to get my head around this, like you, I don't know what, I don't know what to do, man. And I've seen, I, like, I have other circumstances. I, I had a, Another young kid, Yeggs, that uh, they were in a bad situation where they actually they robbed a, a white woman at, at a, with a BB gun. Um, I still I believe I still believe in my heart that this kid was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He, he's I don't have daughters, but if I did, he's the type of kid I I would want young, type of young man I would want my daughter to marry. 
wow. just one of the top 1% of kids I've ever coached. And, um, you know, so this whole situation, the whole situation happens and, uh, make a real super long story short, you know, long trial. Uh, he comes to a practice of ours, you know, kind of unannounced and, you know, yeah. I kind of bring him in, uh, bring him in because our, our team was happy to see him. They knew what he was going through. Uh, our, our kids kind of knew, um, you know, our, our kids kind of knew, um, you know, how much, how much stress he was under. Well, let me bring up a point there because I, I can't speak for all, all folks. I can only speak of my own experience. I find it amazing that I was naive to it in high school. And I went to the high school that I coached at. And it was almost like as a kid, you were colorblind, right? And, and that's what they tell you. This is a learned behavior. And I can remember, um, you know, being in, being in, being in high school and, and I think people have this misunderstanding that, like, no, you just don't talk about it. Like, we talked about it all the time. We joked about it all the time. I mean, there were white jokes, there were black jokes. I mean, it was never poor taste and, uh, you know, out of color. But it was, but it was, I mean, that was, we accepted it, right? Yeah. And I think that's what people, you know, they kind of they kind of run from it and don't talk from it. So anyway, we, we brought, this kid came in and our, our, all our kids were happy to see him. And I took a picture with him. And basically, uh, the administration brought me in. And they chastised me for it. Uh, you know, basically now in retrospect, where I was probably wrong is I, I did I posted that picture on social media. If I if I could do that over again, I probably wouldn't because there was a trial going on. Yeah. And that probably wasn't smart. Um in my heart though, I knew the kid was innocent. Uh, um I still do. And um I, and I even remember the administrator like saying, like, how can you do this with with this criminal? It's like, okay, well, this is one of your kids who was just a graduation speaker who um, you know, at our, when we won a state championship was the guy we had representing us on the jumbotron, uh, talking about class uh, and, and, and by the way, isn't there due process in this country? Isn't this, aren't you innocent until proven guilty? Yeah, exactly. And it, once again, just like ripped out my left ventricle, man, because I'm just like, holy smokes. Uh, if that was my son, would, 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 would he be called a criminal before he was even proven guilty? Mm. And that's just, uh, again, man, um, uh, it's not right. Um, and I, obviously I can't do anything about that. What I, what we as leaders can do is when we have the opportunity is to do something about it. And again, I, as probably to protect my job and cause I wanted to keep coaching there, I was told I could have got, I could have got fired for that. If I can go back, I, I would, I would have made a bigger stink over that because it wasn't right. It wasn't right to say to, to, before any due process was done, to call a kid a criminal and to say he was guilty. Yeah. You know, you know, the thing that, um, the thing about this whole situation with this hate and the, and the racism is we've allowed for so long little drips of poison to enter our life. So I always call like negativity and stuff, but like an arsenic drip, you know, it doesn't kill you on that day or the week or the month, but over time we pass somebody saying something about another race that's derogatory or hate filled and we just kind of dismiss it. And then, you know, we pass another one another week and then we dismiss it and then we don't call them out on it. So over time, arsenic kills you over time. Those things lead to where we are, I think, you know, cause we, and man, I'm going to say that I'm going to say something I've never told really anybody. I, I think I was the same way as you growing up in, in, in white Pennsylvania. Um, we had a few, we had a few, uh, you know, minorities here and here and there, but it's mostly a white area. We told jokes, man. And we laughed about it, you know, with, with the different, different races we laughed about and didn't think it was a big deal, but it was a big deal. Now that I look back at it, it was a big deal. Um, you know, we didn't do it with hate. We just, we just did it out of, you know, kind of ribbon on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I followed to West Point, you know, um, a little bit with, you know, I have friends in all races, all parts of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think we're mature enough to process correctly. I don't think a lot of people are. So then they hear these things and they, they don't process correctly and it turns into something. I hate. Uh, well, I well how many folks, Chris, would raise their hands and say, oh, yeah, I'm a racist. Like, who, who's going to, who, who knows Good they're point. a racist? And it, like I was telling you about the conversation I was having last night with that young, with that young black man, man. And I told him, I said, I said, son, listen to me. And I, and I do call him son. We have that type of relationship. I said, listen to me. I said, 
you know, by you saying, you know, or by you putting on social media what you're saying, um, you know this, this is not black against white. This is everybody against racism. Mm -hmm. So for you saying, hey, we're going to shoot, uh, you're now, even though if you don't mean this, you could be insinuating that, hey, man, all cops are this way. Mm. Right. And and you you dang sure know there are good people, good, bad people everywhere. Right. There are good white people, good black people, good cops, bad cops. Heck, there were good and bad people at West Point. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I firmly believe nobody makes through their own accident with the exception of probably me. But for the most part, I mean, there's there's good and bad people everywhere. And, and I and I think that's what got through to him is like, if you go down that route, then you're no better against what you're perpetrating in the first place. Like, you know, if we. I mean, if we're you know, smashing windows and shooting before trying to understand, um, that's not going to get anybody to listen to you. Yeah. And that's the most important thing is is to get into a position where 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 people have to listen. And and I think I and, I, and that, that's what I told that young man. I said, listen, man, like I let you down because I probably could have made some change in the past, and I haven't. And I haven't done. I said, I know you love me, coach, and I want you to get them to see the way you do. I'm like, well, then that's something I owe to you. So tell me, you know, the, the best way, the way that, that you want them to view you and, and, and I'll, and I'll do my best. Yeah. And uh, like, like I said, it was just a, a beautiful conversation. Um, and, and, you know, in my experience, I don't know about you, but I've never had somebody like, you know, raise their hands and say, you know, yes, I'm a racist. I mean, it's just, it's just not something that, I don't know. Maybe it's kind of like being you know, bipolar or a narcissist. I don't think anybody's going to uh, mistakenly raise their hand and acknowledge that problem. Yeah. Um, so I think what we need to focus on is, like you said, is the ability to listen, Chris, to dial in, uh, and just the understanding that, hey, man, there's there's three types of people in this world. There's those who know, those who don't know, and those that don't know, they don't know. And as leaders, if, if somebody's in that, you know, third category, and we're trying to change their mind, we're probably wasting our time, yeah. right? I mean, you know, from being deployed and serving. There's evil out there in the world, brother. There, there are certain people that just want, they just want, you know, death and destruction, right? And it doesn't matter if a person's black, female, uh, you know, a, ch a child. Some folks just want to see the, the world burn. And, we, and, and in my opinion, we can't worry about those folks, right? We have to worry about uh, the people, the hearts and minds that we can change and the hearts and minds that we can win. And I told this young man last night, I go, I think besides telling someone you love them, the most important thing you tell them is you believe in them. And I said, and I, I keep, I want to keep wanting to say his name. I said I believe in you, and you can change. You, I wouldn't say this to everybody. I said, why do you think I'm calling you? You, you call some of your teammates. Ask them if I talk to them, because there, there's some of your teammates downtown, you know, acting crazy right now. I'm not calling them. I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you because I believe in you, and you are a guy that can make a difference. Mm. So take this anger and use it for the good. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm. I would bet on it that, that he will. I know he will. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, the, we we maybe sometimes don't realize the gravity of our words, but just that right there, coach is going to stick with him. I mean, that could change route, change his route, change his course, or keep him on the good course that he's on. But, yeah, we don't understand or we don't always um, appreciate you know, how much our words impact people. And I think the fact that you took the time and just talked to him, I mean, that says a lot with, with, well, all I know I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, besides, like I said, besides telling someone you love them, I think telling you to believe in them is, uh, is the most important thing you can tell someone. Uh, I, I played for my father, my father, he still, he, he was, I played for him in high school. We, we won two state championships in high school. Um, and I, many coaches were with me. And now we, we won three state championships and coaches with me. He's won seven total. He's a legend in Ohio. Um, he mm -hmm. still, he coaches, he coached with me now, but before, before we kind of got let go. And, um, he, you know, growing up, Chris, he used to always have, he used to always have a saying, he used to always say, you know, you may not win every race, but you'll always be my horse. And that, his thing was that I'm going to believe in you till the day I die. I'll never stop believing in you. And I, I think about, you know, my own life, when I applied to West Point, I think I was like, I was 40, I don't think, I know I was 41st out of 140 people, 41 people in my class. And I took my, I took the application to my guidance counselor and I said, you know, I, I got this letter in this from, from West Point, they only played basketball there. And she said, don't even apply there, you're wasting your time, you won't even get it. Wow. And, and I think I was very motivated by that. It was at that moment when I decided I want to go to West, I want to go to West Point. And I always thought my whole life, that's what drove me. I, I, 
you know, if you watch the Michael Jordan documentary, it was like mm. people telling you you can't do things. And, and I always thought my entire life was around that. And I was a 5'11 white guy, couldn't play division one basketball. And I wasn't smart enough to get into West Point. And I never had any experience to, to make presidents called in sales and, you know, didn't have enough military experience to be the youngest, you know, civilian aid in the history of the, of the United States of America. I look back now and you know what really drove me, Chris, is what you just said, is my old man believing in me. That's what really drove me. It wasn't people telling me I couldn't do things. It was what was etched in my soul and in my heart that my dad thought I could do it all. He never doubted me. Yeah. And, you know, uh, with my own children, uh, and it's hard, right? You always just want to point out what they're doing wrong. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have a middle one that's just like me, can't just super high energy and ADHD and yeah. Uh, it's like, like it's hard. sometimes you just got to catch them doing something right and yeah. when they do wrong you got to tell them hey I, I believe in you and that's all i tried to do with this young man last night man it's such a you know leadership's not complicated uh i would think we'd like to complicate it because then it doesn't hold us accountable to it but what you just said is easy to understand it's not a complicated thing we just we have to show up you know and it doesn't take take a lot uh, to speak into someone's life. I always say like, if you wake up in the middle of the night, right, and it's dark, all you need is a little bit of light to orient yourself to where you're at and to keep you going, you know, without kicking the edge of the dresser or whatever. All you need is that little LED across the room. And I think leaders nowadays need to be the dang light. We need to be the LED that says, I believe in you. I'm always gonna be in your corner. You're gonna make mistakes. Okay, I'm still in your corner. Just those things that you said, man. Look what it's done for you. Look what your dad. Well, did. We've gone to this part part of, uh, you know, hiring and firing isn't just the only part of leadership. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think of like when it comes to college sports. You know, they have these athletic directors now have these search firms, and I remember being in sales. I, I one of the best people I ever worked for was a guy by the name of uh, Michelle Zwickel. She's she runs Thermal Fisher Diagnostic. Uh, scientific now and, and she would say all the time she would say like you are going to be based on who you get on the bus and I took that as a coach right I don't want the best players I want the right ones and as a leader you have to know what you're looking for and once you once you get them um, just when something goes wrong or you know to never mentor them or to never develop them uh, you know we, we just it's just been incredible and I know my in my own experience I mean I just work for a job where I'm proud of what we did 10 years we were about as successful as you can possibly be Chris yeah and, and when they let when they let me go it was I never had one report card it was never it was never hey this is what you can do better or uh, it was never sit down and say you know I know you can do this and mm. um, you know and that and that's what happened to that right and I was talking to a buddy last week in my casserole and and I brought up a or he brought up a great point. He's like, yeah, he's like, a, uh, because he was a branch transfer from the chemical court. And now he's a, uh, an infantry battalion commander. Wow. He said, there were so many people that just put for whatever reason, just put the mentorship and development in me. Um, and, and I will say for, for all of our folks that are, you know, gotten out, uh, don't take that for granted. You know, you just said, don't complicate, you know, don't complicate leadership. Well, don't take special for granted. And there's something to be said about the fact that we come from the greatest institution of leadership in the world. And there's something to be said for the fact that at the army, we make that a priority. We yeah. invest in our people. Uh, you know, my boss, you know, Ryan McCarthy, secretary McCarthy always says, we're going to win with people. Those are the two things that are really important in the army is we have to win. So true. Because if we don't just like in with us, uh, you know, with this COVID, if we don't win, people are going to die. Yeah. And the most important thing is always going to be our people. So if our people are the most important thing, then why, why do we not invest in them? You know, why do we, why do we turn them over so quick, especially when we have someone that's uh, we know is worth it. And how about some of you so-called leaders just using it as a case study? How about just sitting down and trying to tell somebody, Hey, I believe in you and you can do this and see if that works as yeah. opposed to just as soon as things get tough. Yeah. Instead, what they do is when they don't, when they stop performing, they start documenting it to, you know, to, to cover their butt later on or whatever, or to build a case. Well, why don't you try investing in, in the people? I, you know, with this consulting company I've had for five years, Diligent Plans, you know, I, I've talked to hundreds of leaders. Um, one of them, 
showed me their performance counseling book in in the last five years, one of them. And for, for, for those of you who don't know who are watching, performance counseling is a proactive developmental tool that you use for your subordinate uh, followers, leaders under you, whatever. Basically, you, you visit with them regularly. You tell them what they can work on. You give them the resources and the coaching and the encouragement that they need to get there. You revisit it in 90 days and see how they did and then set new goals. And it's proactive. It's not the HR pencil whip that you have to do once a year just to make everything kosher in the legal department or whatever BS they've come up with nowadays. But man, one person, it's all you got to, if you if you're in a leadership role, a, you're called to it, B embrace it and love the people that you're in, man. I get so frustrated when I just invest in people, man. <laughs> invest well, it's, it, and, and I think back to, um, I don't, don't want to use names, but like the last, the last time I had somebody sit in a room and set expectations for me as a coach, uh, you know, he got, got in there and said, okay, when or we'll find somebody who will. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, man, uh, when it comes to this, at the school I was at, there's really not another school in Ohio that has ever won as much as we have. But yet, there was never one time, Chris, where I got up in front of my team and I said, when or we'll find somebody. Wow. What we focused on was, was our culture. What we focused on was building leaders. Yep. And then that led to our behavior, which produced our results. And, and you know, the, the, the formula I've kind of come up with um, through the years is, is I, I really feel like, okay, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to build leaders. In order to do this, you got to first learn to become a good teammate. You got to learn to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And, mm. uh, you know, we talked about stuff going on racially in our country. I mean, being a cop, I don't know. Kind of suck right now, wouldn't it? Who, who's raising yeah. their hands? You know, to be a cop right now. Like, my goodness. And I kind of feel that way about high school coaches. I mean, um, you know, you hear all the horror stories about parents. In my own circumstance, my parents were incredible. It was kind. Of, it, was, it was more of an administration that wouldn't, uh, it didn't have the same values or didn't see things the same way I did. But I mean, you hear, you hear all the time about about parents mm -hmm. um, and how it's just you know they're all trying to. They want their kids to be a superstar or be very unrealistic. And it's just, it's a, it's a, for the money you make for all the, it's, it's a tough, it's tough to be a high school coach right now in any sport, um, you know, not just basketball. So I, I think that I always teach you, you gotta be, you gotta be, in order to be a leader, you gotta be a great teammate. In order to get to that part where you're going to be a great teammate, you have to be coachable. Yeah. Like you have to be willing to be corrected. And we're talking and talking about leadership. I think we always point to the kids. Right. We always point and say, yeah, you know, they're entitled. We're dealing with this entitled generation. Well, a lot of times, what are we doing to make our coaches better? What are we doing to make our teachers better? What are we doing to make, you know, like how much are we pushing those folks as, as opposed to just assuming, OK, you're in this role now. Uh, you know, Now, here you go. Uh, I was let go as a high school basketball coach. There was not one time where somebody was in there grading my practice. Right. That's my classroom. My response to that would be, would a principal ever uh, fire a teacher without ever being in their classroom? Wow. I think the answer is no. Would a sales director ever get rid of a territory manager or a salesman or woman without ever riding along with them? I think we know that the answers to both of those are no. Man, and, and for, for those of you watching, we'll, we'll talk about this in another uh, episode, but I just want to, I just want to give you some praise there, babe. Um, so so basically, as a coach, he, he called somebody on something that they should have known better. He called him on it, and he got caught up in the political engine and got let go for, for man, I, I got to temper my, uh, my emotions yeah, yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. He got let go because yeah. he did the right freaking thing. Now, I guarantee he doesn't regret doing the right thing. So if you're a leader, do the right damn thing all the time. And don't worry about it. Now, you know what? This is going to release Coach to go on and do much bigger things than he already did. And you're thinking, well, three-time state champion basketball player, all the kids. He's in. Yeah, he did have a lot of influence. And he won titles. And But he's going to go bigger. So never be afraid as a leader to do the right thing, even if there's repercussions. We, we got, we got um, leaders nowadays who aren't willing to fall on the sword anymore. Well, I just, I just gave you an example, Chris, of when I didn't. I just gave yeah. you an example when I knew something should have been said, should have been done, and 
my silence said, you know, my, my kids, especially my young black kids, they saw my silence. They saw me do, do nothing. Yeah. And, um, you know, that speaks, that speaks just as many volumes that speak, you know, just, just as loud. And, and, and believe me when I tell you like that one incident wasn't, uh, you know, I, I feel like they were at that point kind of looking for a reason. Um, and that, and that's okay. I, like I told you, I, I have no regrets. Definitely in that circumstance you were talking about, I have no regrets of doing the right thing. I think if you really truly believe in anything, strongly enough you have to be willing to, to sacrifice everything for it uh, I, I definitely believe that everything happens for a reason I mean, we're both west point graduates everything good in my life came from going to west point to include meeting my wife and having my kids yeah uh, so i you know I, I think so many times too um it's just like it's just like what's going on right now in the world you know there could be a hundred positive things and you you see that one negative thing and you dwell on that and that's the same thing in my situation chris i, I refuse to dwell on the negative, right? Like, um, I'm still a graduate from Maryland. I'm drinking out of my VASJ cup right now. Uh, my, my son is a sophomore. They're going to be a junior there. I, um, I refuse to let the negativity uh, encapsulate what we, what we accomplished. And as a high school coach, um, the most important thing, as any leader, the most important thing you have are relationships. And they can't, nobody can take those away. And, and sometimes you won't know the job of, of, a, of a coach until 15 or 10, 15, 20 years from now down the road. And, um, you know, that that's the part where, you know, what are those folks going to contribute to society? I have a young man that's getting ready to, uh, well, he's already commissioned, but he's getting ready to, he's getting ready to graduate with your daughter on June 13th, uh, Jacob oh. Stauffer. Yeah. Um, just an incredible, I mean, just, it doesn't get any better than that. I, because they were home because of the COVID, I was able to go and take part of his commissioning ceremony. And almost just brought me to tears just because I said to myself, man, um, you know, if this happened another time period, I probably wouldn't be in this position. I, I mean, uh, I coached a West Point uh, graduate. Like, come on, man. Like, how, how incredible is that? Yeah. And a kid that I know is going to make our, our country better. And, uh, you know, you talk about these these you know race relations. His his best friend uh, was it was a young man, who, um, white skinned black kid who actually like got punked by cops at one point. And wow. it's still very, very, uh, you know, deep in his fabric. It's something he's always kind of taken with him. And him and I were having a conversation. I said, well, you remember this when you're going on to lead America's Sons and Daughters, because it's going to it's gonna serve you well, because your soldiers will know. They'll, they'll know if you care for them. And the reality is they know when you don't care for them. And that's way more important than anything you know. Yeah, man, it's such a great point. Yeah, and congratulations. That's an honor, man, um, to, to go... Uh, to have coach someone like that. Uh, you know, we talked, we talked about something the other day. I think we have some time to get into it maybe a little bit. So you, you're standing on the sidewalk watching this incident unfold with George uh, Floyd, right? And you're mm-hmm. seeing everything. You're seeing the cop's behavior. You're hearing what he's saying. You're seeing it. And you and I talked about it and we had, we had an idea about how we would have acted, but I just want to kind of bring that out. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do if you're standing on the sidewalk? You know, you know that if you intervene, you're going to get sprayed or maybe shot. Uh, But then again, the life is escaping a man right in front of you. I don't, man, what do you do? You want to talk about that? Is that, is that? Yeah. uh, I mean, it's just, I'm not going to lie to you. It's just, it was really hard to watch. It's infuriating. I, I, it's just, I mean, I, I didn't watch it more than once. I, I just, I couldn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I did notice. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's a great point because I, I noticed that some of the folks that I feel like are the, in terms of my peers, that are the best leaders I've ever met. Um, that's the point where they mentioned is not the situation. The fact that people sat there and watched it. Yeah. Right. Uh, every time I'm thanked for Veterans Day, Memorial Day, I don't know about you, but I, it's always very humbling. Uh, I always kind of give the same answer. Like, I'm no hero, but man, I know a bunch. Of mm. And uh, I, had a, I had a conversation with one of our classmates, Jamie Eftergraff, who was, uh, you know, if Jamie's listening, he was the absolute worst cadet, maybe in the history of West Point. I mean, he's could talk to some people. He's definitely in the top 10. Uh, but he's also um, one of the best leaders I've ever met in my life. And I know one thing that was the part he was the most upset by Chris was that people could sit there and watch when, Hey man, this isn't right. 
You know, it's, uh, and this is maybe, maybe this is a simplistic analogy, but like you're in the playground when you were a kid and someone's getting the crap kicked out of them. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and now I, I think what has happened is because uh, this comes down to people with position of authority abusing their power. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like, you know, the same thing has happened a lot in, in my faith that I've grown up with in 43 years, which is a Catholic church. So now, you know, you have, you know, you have one priest abusing his power and doing things he's not supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen people in the Catholic faith, you know, faith abuse their power. And, and, you know, you're holding someone to a standard that you're not adhering to yourself. And, and maybe that's why I'm no longer coaching because I just refuse to watch adults hold kids to a standard that they don't adhere to themselves. Mm. And, you know, now from a cop's perspective, um, obviously 98, maybe 99% of these cops believe in that, right. And they, they, they would do something. Yeah. And now, but now the problem is, um, you have one that abused it. And uh, I don't know where I saw this online somewhere. It might've been Will Smith or somebody. It's like, Hey man, um, this stuff's been going on. We just, we haven't filmed it like we are now. Yeah. It's been going I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. What, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I know what the answer isn't. I know the answer isn't to, you know, bust through windows and shoot, shoot more innocent people. I, I know that's not, I know that's not the answer. I, I know that's not going to, I know. I mean, like Martin Luther King said, like, Hate's not going to drive out hate, brother, right? I mean, only, 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 only love is. Um, and I think of like, where, where have the, where have the real men gone? You know what I mean? I mean, like, um, where have the men gone? Who uh, I think I heard my old boss said one time, said, you know, when you marry your wife, your, your wife is someone you die for, but your buddies are someone you die with. Mm. You know, where, where is? Where where have the real men gone that are considered saying, you know what, that that's not right. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to watch that take place. Yeah. And maybe we need to get back to that. I know you and I use the term, you know, last of the cowboys. Last of uh, the cowboys. Yeah. We're hurting for leadership, brother. We're we're hurting for the, the and the cowboys are out there. I, I know they're out there. Um, <laughs> what they need is they they need to they need to regroup. They need to recalibrate, and, and they need to know that they're needed now more than ever, man. Um, totally agree. And, you, yeah. know, and, and, you know, we, we've done this to ourselves too a lot, Yanks, because, uh, you know, think about it, like how, I mean, you know, from a combat arms background and, uh, and there's another thing that comes from my dad. We don't tell each other we love each other enough, especially, <laughs> especially us men. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, a the, my mentor uh, in the CASA program, and I hope he's listening, uh, Mr. Wilhelm, Craig Wilhelm. Uh, he's a West Point graduate. He's out, he's out in Oregon. Uh, I forget what year he graduated. It was right after Ted Offensive, I think, when he, when he graduated. I'm joking. I mean, he's not that <laughs> old. But he he said it to me during our last con our last CAF CASA conference in DC. He said, "You know, Quaz, as men, we don't tell each other that we love each other enough." Yeah, that's great. And you know, and then, and then I think what happens is, um, and again, uh, this is my this is my opinion. You know, like then fear fear rules us, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I don't I don't want to think for a second what was going through this this cop's head when he did that. But I know one thing, I know he's afraid. He's afraid of something. He's yeah. afraid of something. Uh, there's not love in his heart. I mean, there, there's dark, there's, you know, that's dark in his heart. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we say, okay, what can we do? Well, we can start with the relationships that we have and, and especially uh, us men, because, you know, I, I think we've kind of gotten away from, um, you know, the heart of, of what makes us a man. Right. And it's not, so it's not only protecting our family, uh, but protecting each other, right, and doing something for each other, you know, and, and willing to put on a line for each other. That's a great point, man. Yeah, you're right. We don't say that as men very often. I don't know why. Um, maybe it's built into us. Maybe we think it's weak. Maybe we think it's not necessary. I, I don't know. But you're right. We uh, my we used to have a chapel service before every game we would play, and we would bring uh, a guest speaker into our chapel service because before every game, and the only rule we had is we couldn't talk about anything that had to do with basketball. We had to be, talk about being a man, being a husband, being a father, being a Christian, mm. being a good person. And my dad, every year I would give him one game to speak at, you know, he's 70, going to be 78 years old. He would get up there and tell the kids that he's got underwear older than they are. And, but that was one thing he always told him. He said, if you truly love someone, you shouldn't go a day where you don't tell them that. Wow. And, Every one of his ex-players, the guy's been coaching for, I mean, he's 78 years old. He's literally been coaching since he was 18 years old. So 
you know, 60 years he's been doing this. And I'll still like look at it. I'll see, I'll see him crying and say, oh, uh, Stan Kimber just wrote me a text, you know, said he loved me, uh, Desmond Howard. Um, but there's, 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 such a, there's such a great message in that, right? And, and even our young kids now, look, they call him Papa, say, I love you, Pops. And that's just so powerful. It's so easy, and yet it's so powerful. And mm. I feel like we got to get back to it. Yeah. Man. Yeah, it's such a great point. Um, so, you know, those of you tuning in, uh, why not call some people today? Uh, why wait? You know, you know, I think a lot of the – some of the issues we have is we're, we're waiting to take action. Well, you know, it's later than you think. Um, that, that phrase has resonated with me for years. It's later than you think. So why not today call some people on your contact list, uh, close to, close to tell them you love them, tell them you love them. And how about in this day and age, you and I talked about this in this day and age, we have no excuse. It's the information age. Oh. Like we have no excuse for not communicating and just, just checking on people. I, I have a buddy here who is, he has a huge media presence. Mm. Um, uh, it's so hard because I don't want to use names, but he's hurting Yeggs. He he is hurting, and I know he's got a he's got a uh, a white wife, um, you know. So his kids are his kids are mixed, and man, he I just know he's hurting. So I call them, and I never leave voicemails. I think voicemails are the the I think they're pretty worthless, right? And I I told him uh, I said, hey man, call me because I got to hear your voice, and I, and I know you know. I mean, I know you need you need to hear this. Um, and I, I need to hear your voice because I know, I know how bad you're hurting and I, and I, and I just want to listen. Yeah. We, we have no excuse nowadays with the fact that you can pick it up and just send a text. Say, hey, Hey, how you doing? You yeah. know, you're doing pretty, 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 you're doing good. Uh, uh, I know after I got let go, I had a buddy of mine, um, from red, white, and blue. Uh, he, he, he worked at, he worked, he used to work at my company and he just, just was the easiest thing. Text. Hey, Quas, you doing, you doing okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good, man. Why? It's like, oh, you know, your, the velocity of your social media posts, you were firing off a lot. But it just meant so much that, you know, his, his antenna was raised. And he yeah. was just thinking, hey, um, you know, how are you doing? If anything, now with the information age, it should make this easier for us, Yeggs. And for whatever reason, now it's, we've made it harder. And I think, I think a big part of the reason is there's no depth anymore, yeah. right? Like you and I talked about the, the depth of our conversations. Like we're not talking about small stuff. Right. And now it's okay. This is what it is on social media. And it, it's about, you know, likes and retweets and, and, and that's not real. That's not real life. Right. That th those aren't real relationships. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've had people judge me. They're like, Oh, you, you feel like your life, you know, your life is so great online. It's not that great. Well, nobody gets on there and says, uh, I'm getting divorced. I lost my job. I'm getting ready to kill myself. But, like that's just not, it's, it's, it's normally highlights. highlights. And I, I think the other pieces with today, and, you know, having a daughter that's about to graduate from West Point, these kids can reach out thousands and thousands of miles. A kid from California can talk to, you know, can talk to a kid in Ohio. I mean, shoot, you can still talk to your old boyfriend or girlfriend still at West Point, but you couldn't do that when we went. Right? Yeah. But, but I think what's been sacrificed are the depth of those relationships. They're not as deep. Whereas you and I both know, uh, man, that I can pick up the phone and, and I can call Brian DeCody and I can call... Corey Henry and I can call, you know, uh, Regan Campbell, my old roommate, and, and, and I can call Ryan Shaw uh, to write me a to write me a good speech. Um, <laughs> but and, and you, you know the jigs. You could not talk to those guys or gals in forever, right? right? Uh, in forever, um, and it, it doesn't matter because the depth is is so much of those relationships. I tell you, if our classmates are listening, I talk about get emotional because uh, I'm sitting there with my my breast cancer shirt on. But, um, you know, my, my wife's kind of is going, going through this fight for those that do or don't know. But um, I'm thinking of one of our classmates, and I will, I will say a name here, Chris, is uh, Jeanette Kalsman. Talk about, um, like, there hasn't, like, been a, there hasn't been a, literally, like, a week gone by where Jeanette hasn't reached out to my wife. And some, whether it's a postcard or, uh, you know, um, checking on her. And I just think to myself, like, talk about a leader, yeah. right? <laughs> talk about a friend. Uh, just talk about a, a great human being. And um, man, we could all we could all probably be a lot more like Jeanette Couchman and, and, be, and be pretty pretty successful in life. So Jeanette, if you if you're listening, love you, and I can't can't tell you how much that has meant to to Laura and myself. Man, that's Thank awesome. You. 
Maybe I, sh- maybe I should get Jeanette on here. We should talk to talk to her at some point. Um, sounds like uh, that's, you know, I think a lot of times we, um, we, um, you can you hear me okay? Yeah, I got you. Sorry, my microphone did something weird on the screen. Yep. You know, a lot of times we talk about leadership and we and we we kind of pontificate and we get really academic. But that example that you just mentioned, with Jeanette, that's leadership in action. I think today we need leadership in action, man. You got to show up. I mean, simple to understand here again, but it's missing for whatever reason. Show up. Show up. That that, that young man I was telling you about, Jacob Stopper, who's about to uh, about to graduate June thirteenth. I uh, b- before he graduated from VASJ, I said, you know, I said, Jake, what did you learn? What do you learn here? You know, as part of our program, as being part of the school. And he wrote me, I, I wrote him a letter before he went to West Point. He wrote me a letter back. And he said, Coach, I learned that it's God, others, and then myself. Mm. And I go back to what we just talked about with Jeanette, right? It's like um, the concept really isn't that hard. You know, put, yeah. put others uh, before yourself. Yeah. Um, and you know, Chris, it's, it's ingrained in us, right? I, I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen um, – I mean, I've gone on school trips, right? And I've seen administrators eat before their kids. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, like, like yeah, let your kids exactly. eat first, right? Hey, or you're, if, you're, if you're a coach huh. and you're, you're not letting your kids eat first, like, oh, and this was stuff obviously that, you know, we learned. Um, it's easy, but it works. You know, it's, yeah. the, the fundamentals work. Uh, they, they have an 1802 and they do, do now. So we need to get back to the fundamental leadership. I'll tell you just a quick story as it relates to basketball. I, I you know, I've had the pleasure the last couple of years through Under Armour uh, of working with, with Stephen Curry. We would bring the best players in the world, uh, high school players, to his camp out, out in Oakland. And, and one year, uh, super respectful of the military, by the way, Chris, Patriot. Uh, I remember That's the first time I met him, looked me in the eye, shook my hand. Yeah. Uh, you know, hey, Captain Quasi, thanks for your service. And he still to this, you know, still calls me Captain. Captain um, but I remember one time going to watch. He invited me to come watch one of his workouts, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch. At that point, was was the most skilled basketball player in the world. I'm from Cleveland, so I can't, you know, say he was the best player in the world. LeBron, folks will get mad. <laughs> but uh, I remember going to watch him and thinking to myself, like, okay, this is going to be incredible. I'm going to watch this guy's workout. I'm, I'm a high school basketball coach. I can't wait to watch him work out. Yikes, it was the most basic stuff you ever saw in your life. Like, yeah. if you're a basketball guy, it was like footwork and shooting drills that, that, that I would teach to a, I have a second grader that I would teach to my second grader. Wow. And my point is that the basics, the fundamentals are, are, all, are always going to work. Yeah. So if, if, if they've been teaching fundamental leadership at West Point since 1802 and it's worked, and we've produced the likes of Eisenhower and MacArthur and, and Patton, like, you know, and Yeager. Uh, <laughs> why, why are we going to, why, why would we go away from that? Yeah. Right? Why would we go away from the fundamentals of what work? And like you said, leadership is not, leadership is not complicated. I tell you what, winning's not complicated either. So don't complicate winning. Do yeah. not complicate winning. If we do the right things and we do more than anybody else, we're, we're, we're going to win. Hmm. I feel like leadership works the same way. Man, great point. So I'm going to I'm going to build on on that and ask you a question. So with all this racial tension and in uh, injustice and everything that we're seeing, how do we how do we win? How do we win at that? How how can we cuz that's a big question. How do we get past this? Jeez, it's been going on for since the beginning of time. Um how do we beat it, man? How, how can we beat it as, you know, as leaders, as white men who are disassociated from the brunt of it, but still care? What, I don't know. I, you know, I'd love to, what do you think? How, how can we win? I mean, besides the things we talked about, meet people where they are, call them, spread love, not hate. Is there anything else that you think we can do um, that we can sink our teeth into? Well, I don't know, man, if I, 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 I'd be making a lot more money than I am now you know, <laughs> yeah, if I, yeah. I the that. but i will say you know you know my hashtag is winners win mm. and when i'm talking about that i think people confuse the fact that i'm that i'm talking about the scoreboard and i'm absolutely not right um, i know every time i failed in my life it's because i quit mm. so i look back to uh, there was a time when i was coaching when i was like man i'm you know, these people aren't 
living up to like the standards. Okay, I'm done. And, and that was a mistake. Uh, I, this will be a different podcast, but, uh, you know, I was so um, bad in a bad place that I really thought my wife and kids were better off without me. And so the, the 22 veterans a day killing themselves means a lot to me because I could have been one of those statistics. Yeah. Um, and I thank God every day that I'm not, and, and I'm here. Um, we all do, man. I say, when I say the hashtag winners win, Yeggs, I, I think the only thing we can't do is give up. And I think uh, like last night when I, when I saw that tweet from that, the young man that I was telling you about, I know he would never go shoot, shoot people. I know he wouldn't because I, I know his heart. He's shown me his heart. So he's venting. Yeah. Uh, what he needed from me was to know that not all white people have given up. And so yeah. I, I know that's the answer. I, I know the answer is not doing nothing. I know that. I know the answer is not, nah, we can't fix it. Can't be fixed. I know that's not the answer. I'm positive of that. Yeah. And so when you, when you talk about, you know, winning and we, and we have to win this, um, get out of your comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. get, get, out of your, get, out of your, get out of your comfort zone. I mean, like I just sat here and told you about how good my relationship, my relationships have been with minorities. Well, maybe they're not, maybe they're not as good as I think they are. Maybe they could, they could definitely be better. Right. I, Cause I can, I can tell you, um, you know, just like when I go around the country and try to talk to other, you know, try to talk to folks that have been struggling with mental health, my wife tells me all the time, you can't save them all, you know what, but maybe I can save one. Mm. And that, that's worth it, isn't it? Maybe I can get one of them. And then after that, I get, and after that I'm going to go get another one. And then after I do that, I'm going to go get another one. Uh, I feel like it's the same way with this. So, you know, we're sitting there saying, we're trying to fix this, man, just, just fix one relationship. You know, like you said, just, just call one person, you know, just call one person. Uh, this is going to almost sound terrible. Um, but my wife's grandfather fought in the Battle of Bulge, 97 years old. Wow. Um, Dale, God bless him. He, he was just an incredible man. Uh, like literally had the best heart, best heart. Yeah. Greatest generation, best heart in the world. Yeah. But he, I remember talking to him. He would always like, tell me, he's like, he would always say my black friend, like, you know, it was, it was singular. <laughs> <laughs> God bless him. I just remember thinking like, great. and that was a different time, right? I mean, uh, I mean, you thought racism. I mean, obviously, you know, the Japanese were trying to kill him. Like, if he just, you know, and he lived out. He worked for Boeing, so he lived out in Seattle. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he had major issues. Yeah, uh, and, and and that stuff stemmed through fear, mm -hmm. right? And I and I think of um, the only way to break that is to is to is to get out of your comfort zone. I don't know who said it, but you know, ships are safest in the harbor, Chris. But that's not what ships are made for. That's right. They got to They got to get out, and they and they and they got to float. Doing the right thing isn't always isn't always easy, and sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it can get you fired. Sometimes you think you're doing the right thing, and maybe you're not. Yeah. But at least you can go to sleep at night because you, you think you're doing the right thing. I would say and, leadership's not a popularity contest. Yeah. No. 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 And and um. I think there's so many people that are that are now afraid, you know, to stand on to stand on their own two feet, um, you know. And I just I I just think of uh, I just think of all of, I've been spoiled, man, because I've literally I've literally been mentored and led by some of the greatest people in the world. I I can I don't want to bore you. I can give you every coach I ever had since I was in second grade because coaches have had such an impact on my life, and that's why I wanted to be a coach. That's why I am a coach. You know, mm -hmm. they can take the title away, but I'll I'll, I'll coach until the day I die. It might not be basketball, but but to me, coach and leader are synonymous. Uh, but I, I always remember a, a, a lesson General Dempsey t told me about is, is uh, I mean, it's a real long story, but it's in, in one of his books. I think it's in Radical Occlusion, where basically a, a nun tried to come pray at the gate. And and he was like, uh, you know, he went and he was a lieutenant at the time. This is right after he got knighted in England, too. So right after he was, you know, Obama's or uh, President Obama's chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. And he said there were a bunch of uh, minorities playing basketball um, at at the uh, at the courts. And he said at this time it was right after Vietnam, so it was right after the Tet Offensive. The army had a race problem uh, and had a drug problem. Yeah. So he said he was he was he was uh, getting ready to um. Or they were driving the Humvee. Have I told you this story? I don't know if I have. No, no, I haven't heard. Uh, it. This, is one, this is one of my favorite stories on leadership. And uh, he said he was driving the Humvee and. She says, stop the vehicle. 
and stops the vehicle and he starts going through this the military decision making process like oh my gosh you know best case scenario they're going to ignore her worst case scenario i'm going to have a situation because these these you know basketball players are going to run over this nun someone said something to him i don't know if it's like a platoon sergeant or whoever but he turned around and lo and behold the eggs all 10 black soldiers were on their were on their uh knees praying with this nun wow and he said he got back in the humvee and he said he felt about this big she mm. took her finger and she stuck it in his chest and she said don't you ever give up on your soldiers again and he said he decided in that moment in his career that um that wow. he never would and you know that guy made it to the highest position the military's ever had right yeah. uh, and i look back to my own life it's hard. It, it's easier to get, wait, wait, you know, when people are a problem, it's easier to get cut sling load, Chris. It's easier to get rid of them. It's yeah. easier to, you know what, this cancer is metastasizing to the, to the team, to the rest of the body. I'm going to cut it out. And I'm like, that's easy. Yeah. Right. Being a leader is, is, is going and saying, no, you know what? Uh, and especially when you're talking about young people, uh, they need us. They need our leadership. Yeah. And I've always felt like, okay, if they give up on me, so like in my case as a coach, if they transfer or whatever, then, then all right. But as a coach, as a leader, no matter what, I, I can't give up on them. If they hate my guts, I can't give up on them. Right. right? Uh, anyone, any one of us has played any sports. Like, did you always love your coach? <laughs> you, you always love your parents. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're they're not. We're gonna do what's best for you, not always what you want. We're not gonna tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. Mm. And the problem now is that even as, even so much that is the fact that administrators aren't backing the people who are, who are actually leading because they need jobs too. Yeah, man, man. Great, great story. Wow. I must hearing him tell it <laughs> must be amazing. Um, He's a great, little better of a storyteller than I am. Not much. Uh, you're a good storyteller, man. Um, <laughs> He's the best. He is the best. You know, I think, I think um, a good closing point might be, do something. Um, maybe we don't know what it is. And I asked the question, what do we do? And I don't, I don't think we necessarily know, but we got to do something. We talked about um, running the people, you know, we belong at the eye of the storm as leaders. So meet the people where they are. Um, one of the things we also talked about was there's no depth in relationships. I think it's intimidating to have depth because you look at all your your contacts, your contacts on your Facebook or wherever, and you think, oh, I can't go deep with all of them. But like you said, coach, just go deep with a few. I mean, how many people did Jesus disciple in his life? Disciple. I mean, he reached a lot, but how many did he disciple? Twelve. Twelve. Depth. So if you know, if you have a handful of good relationships and you speak life into them, and that carries on to other relationships that they have, honestly, your reach is, you know, look at the disciples after Jesus died. They went on to, you know, basically reach all corners of the world um, and they never quit. You know, if, if you want to really talk about sacrifice, read about Paul sometime in Corinthians. Um, he got, got beaten so many times. He got um, he was just lost at sea. Um, he did. He had so many things come upon him because he took a stand. You know, coach, uh, you were let go because you took a stand. Um but man, we need more leaders like you to take a step. Well, we need we need folks to connect too, Yates. Like yeah. you got me thinking too. Um, uh, my wife's obviously uh, um, my wife's a West Point graduate. Um, she was a little higher in the class than both of us were, I think. <laughs> Combined. Uh, I was thinking about this. We were walking yesterday, and she was saying how you know think of you know racism exists, well, sexism exists. Uh, you know, like think about your daughter now. Uh, I think I saw a cast of stat that it, what. It's like 25%, 23% or something, something there for when, when 99 was there, um, I think it was like, you know, it was like 11%. Yeah. Tops. God bless all those gals too, by the way, because at Susan Gallich's funeral, they were all there and it was just super powerful. Yeah. But I think, you know, I think the ability to connect is something that I think is so lost in today's leader. Yeah. And I think of being at the Army Navy game a couple of years ago, and I saw, um, um, I don't know, Colonel Steele was the first was the first African American to ever play at West Point, ever play football at West Point. Oh, wow. and, guy, and he's just a mountain of a man, great person. And I got to know his daughter Sage Steele on ESPN 
because she came to Steph Curry camp one year and we, we got, we connected then and we were talking about her dad. Um, but I remember, I remember specifically telling Sage uh, that the connection was like, Hey, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not black. Right. I'm as, I'm as, I'm as albino as they come. I'm married to a dermatologist. My kids will never even have any pigment in their, in their, in their skin. But I remember the connection was, and this was the truth. I wasn't making this up. Uh, Colonel Steele was one of my wife's heroes because you know, you think about it, like he broke a barrier, right? And, and, and I remember telling Sage, I said, will you please tell, you know, my wife's a graduate. Will you please tell your dad that he's one of my wife's heroes? Because mm. she always said like, man, I, I can't imagine what it was like to be one of the first, you know, or the first African-American to ever play football there. Mm. And my wife was at the academy one time when it was, it was 11% female. So, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be the same anything to make a connection. Right. right, we just got to find uh, the find the same values. I mean, that, that's that's like being someone's friend, right? You don't have to listen to the same music. You don't have to listen to the. Hmm. Um, you just have to you just have to have the same values. And and I think um, I, I'll, I'll this last thought because I know we're 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 going pretty long. But I think back to my sales career, gigs, and and um, I mean I, I learned a lot in every aspect of life. But that was probably the one job where I could just go and I feel like man, I, I could be. I, I could just go and do it. Like, like I said, I was never very athletic and I played division one basketball. I was never very smart. I made it through West Point. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like, you know, by God's grace, I end up marrying my wife. Like after she said no to me five times, um, like I feel like sales was the one thing I could just go. And if you ask me why, I, just, I felt like I could connect to people. And I had a priest when I was growing up tell me that getting to Jesus is like, um, you know, you could, you can listen to rap, you can listen to R&B, you can listen to country, you can listen to heavy metal, you can listen to Christian music. Um, but as his spiritual leader, he said, my job is to make you get up and dance. Mm. You know, so you know, you'll have a lot of people say, oh, I'm not a dancer. Well, no. Um, when it comes to Jesus, we, we have to make you dance. And I don't know how we do that, but I feel like like we got to we got to make folks dance together. I think like we, we, we have more in common and we got it. We have to find, we, you know, we have to, we have to find that connection wow. and, and, you know, and it's, and, it, and it's not going to be in the same music. It's not going to be in the same culture, um, wow. but it's got to be in the same values. It, it has to be. Wow. And that's, I think that would be where I, where I would start is right. Find out, you know, what makes these two people dance and then find a way to make them dance together. Wow. The ultimate uh, bridge between the gap. Oh man. Hey, um, thanks. Thanks coach. I mean, this was amazing. Um, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad, um, you kind of alluded to it. You had a tough time and, you know, I just want to tell you, and I mean this from my heart, I'm glad you're still here. Um, and you, you speak into my life every time that we have a chance to interact and, uh, unabashedly, I'm going to tell you, I love you, bro. So, thank you. Love you too, man. Thank yeah. you. And for all of our classmates listening out there, I, I, uh, I know we, another time, Chris, we'll go into, we'll go into the depth of kind of what I went through. And I know there's, there's someone out there listening, right? Uh, and I know there's people out there listening and they went through more than I've gone through. Yeah. And we love them too. Um, so proud of our classmates and the things that they're doing, yeah. you know, doing for the, for the world out there. And um, now what, 21 years, brother? I mean, come on. 21. See all that gray in your beard. I don't have any gray hair, man. <laughs> See all that gray. Yeah, but, uh, I, grew, I grew a beard so it looked like I knew what I was doing. I looked too, I looked young like you before, so I had to put. The- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't know how you know I didn't know how military this was going to be, so I was professional, so I had to make sure. I, but yeah, um, if you're out there, like winners win, and you know what? Um, just like West Point, one day at a time, this too shall pass. It'll pass, and uh, it's always darkest before the dawn, right? And yeah. sometimes you just got to. Sometimes you do. You just got to suck it up and get through it. And yeah. um, you know, nobody ever regrets it, right? Nobody ever regrets fighting. No, nobody has ever regretted giving their best. Yeah. People always regret quitting. People always regret not giving their best. Mm. And every time in my life that I've quote unquote failed, uh, it's because I didn't give my best. So yeah. my response to young people all the time is there is no excuse to never not give you that. You'll never regret that. And if you do that, you can live with the consequences. You can live with it. You can, you can, you can deal with that. Yeah. Uh, just don't, 
don't live with that in your heart. You know, get that get that hate out of your heart and, and try. Um, it may not work, but but winners win. And I'm telling you, if you if, if you if you keep if you keep pounding that rock with time and pressure, mm. it'll it'll be okay. Wow. You know, this, this hate-filled racial tension, uh, this COVID-19 crisis, I mean, this is, this is one hell of a year. Leaders are going to help fix what we have going on. And if you're listening to this and if you're not sure if you're a leader, guess what? You are. And Coach and I believe in you. And we believe that you're going to take action and do something. Um, just like coach said, you know, with, with the different, different ways to do that. So thank you so much for tuning in coach Quaz. I appreciate you, brother. Um, thank you. And, and we're going to revisit, we're going to come back again for more. Let's do it. So Anytime, uh, appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody stay safe out there. Take action as a leader and God bless everyone. We'll get through this together. We're going to do it with love and we're going to do it with action. So thank you. <laughs>